Hello and welcome to Political Capital. I'm Karabole Tata. This is the intersection of politics and money. And it goes well with this week's theme of the courts and how politics have influenced them. In the first half, we're going to be looking into the Gupta case that's currently happening in the Bloemfontein High Court. And in the second half, we'll be speaking about Sean Abrams and his constitutional court challenge. But first up, who are the Guptas? Once upon a time, a plane took off from India carrying brothers who would write a chapter in African history. It carried the Gupta brothers, Ajay the eldest, Atul and Rajesh, the youngest, often known as Tony. It was 1993 and South Africa was on the cusp of freedom. Their father, back in India, encouraged the brothers to go and set up in the new South Africa, claiming it was going to be an economic powerhouse, a new United States in Africa. On the ground, the brothers started small with a computer assembly and distribution business called Sahara Computers. Their wealth grew and so did their influence. They soon had a very big friend in a very high place, the head of state, President Jacob Zuma. It helped them wield powerful influence that paved the way to lucrative contracts. It was also the key to the ear of those running the country. The brothers worked hard and expanded their operations. They went into mining and made vast acquisitions. JIC Mining Services, Shiva Uranium and Tegeta Exploration and Resources, Optimum Coal Mine and Kuhnfontein Coal Mine. This portfolio diversified to the spoken and written word, the New Age newspaper and ANN7 TV station. The influence was growing and so was the cash. The whole lot generated revenue of $225 million in 2016. But controversy was coming. The whispers about the Gupta influence rose to screams when the family landed a private plane at the restricted military Vatukluf Air Base near Johannesburg. Suddenly, they were on the front pages of all the newspapers. More so because the private plane was not carrying government officials, but merely guests for a Gupta family wedding at nearby Sun City Resort. It all began to go wrong for the Guptas in 2016. Former public protector Tuli Madonsela's State of Capture report sought to unravel alleged improper and unethical conduct by President Jacob Zuma amid his contentious relationship with the Gupta family. With the change of guard in the President's office, it became increasingly uncomfortable for the Guptas in South Africa. It is believed they took off for Dubai. Investigators are on their tail. In recent weeks, the Hawks, South Africa's FBI, swooped on a Gupta-connected project in South Africa's Free State, a multi-million dollar project to help poor people raise cows that didn't really work out. The investigations continue. Now we are off to the Bloemfontein High Court where the Gupta group of companies is arguing against the freezing of their assets. This is money that was meant to help the poor, but sadly did it. The case revolves around a multi-million dollar plan to get poor people to raise cows near Frida Farm in the Free State. The idea was to pour millions into training poor people to raise cattle and earn a living from it. The Free State Agriculture Department transferred 220 million rand to the company supposed to be running the project, Estina, in partnership with Indian dairy company Paras. Very little of that money was spent on cows. Among the eight people accused in Bloemfontein is Varun Gupta, a nephew of brothers Ajay, Atul and Rajesh Gupta. He is the former CEO of Oak Bay, the Gupta holding company. The man who uncovered the whole story long before it appeared in the newspapers was the leader of the opposition in the Free State Legislature. Roy Yankelson, a member of the Democratic Alliance, heard what was going on in Frida Farm and went to see for himself. The MEC for Agriculture uh, mentioned the Frida Farm in a debate on a budget in the legislature. Obviously, when these issues are mentioned, we go and investigate and see exactly what these projects are about. We also submitted questions in the legislature, and the replies we received from those questions indicated that various 
pieces of equipment and also cattle were going to be bought for this project, this dairy project, at hugely inflated prices. So we continued our investigations, tried to get additional information, and once we realized that we have enough information, we decided to um, send it to the public protector for further investigation. Another thing which is very important is the fact that from the outset, there were no beneficiaries in this project, and even today there are no beneficiaries involved. Any agricultural project starts with beneficiaries. You need people who are going to be involved in the project, emerging farmers who are going to benefit from the project. A government doesn't run dairy farms. So when we realized that there aren't beneficiaries, immediately alarm bells started to ring. Now let's, let's talk figures. How much were the beneficiaries supposed to benefit? How much was this project? And where did this, all this money go? The provincial government has spent about 250 million rand on the project. Up until now, they continue to spend 20 million rand per annum on this project as well. So it's an ongoing project. It didn't stop when the, when the, original, um, the original implementing agent and partner, Stina, who now appeared in court, withdrew. But 250 million rand has been spent on this project so far. And you say there are no beneficiaries. So all of this money, I don't want to, to, to assume it's been out there in the, the, the media, Gupta's, the Gupta wedding. But can you tell us from a person that has been investigating it, where did this money go? There's supposed to be 80 beneficiaries who are benefiting from this project. And before the Democratic Alliance asked questions in the legislature about the beneficiaries, there were no beneficiaries. Once we asked the questions, they went out and drew up a list of people who are supposed to be benefiting. They then drafted a contract between the beneficiaries and the provincial government. And in terms of that contract, the beneficiaries are supposed to own 51% of the project. And the previous company that was involved, Estina, would have owned 49% of the project. Estina subsequently, after plundering and looting the project, there's 250 million rand involved, withdrew from the project without any penalties. And even to date, there's a, the, the Free State Development Co Corporation have been appointed to replace Estina as, as the managers of that project, but to date the beneficiaries are still not involved and the provincial government continues to fund the projects to the tune of 20 million rand a year. Where is this money going? The original funds we know from court documents went to a number of companies and individuals who are linked to the Gupta Empire. And when it comes to accountability, how, how big is the accountability so far? How big is the scale of it? The investigations of both the public protector and the Hawks have um, stopped so far with the officials and the private sector partners, Estina and various other individuals and companies involved. Up until now, there's been no political accountability. And we would like to see the politicians who crafted this project, who implemented this project, brought to book and held accountable for their um, actions in this project as well. Now, we understand that the mayor, I mean the premier, Premier Makashula, his offices were raided earlier on this year. Uh, regarding to this case, you said right across him, was he involved in, in any way? Do you believe that he was involved in any way? We believe that the Premier of the Free State Province, Ais Mahashule, was complicit in the Freer de Dairy project. He and his former MEC for Agriculture, Musa Ben Zizwani, were the political architects of this project. And there are a number of reasons why we say this. He traveled around the world looking for someone to participate in this project, and he found those individuals in India with a company called Estina. The contract between this controversial company Whose, whose manager and the company itself have already been charged and appeared in court as a result of their participation in this project. That contract was drafted in the office of the Premier. There was a National Treasury report in, on this project after an investigation by them that indicated that there was huge financial mismanagement with the funds allocated to this project. They in fact said that the head of Department of Agriculture should be disciplined. 
the Premier who appoints the head of department refused to act against his head of department and in fact continued to appropriate funds for this project even though the National Department of Agriculture also withdrew due to the, to the financial mismanagement of that project. He knew about that and he continued to cover it up and he continued to allocate funds to that. Why would he have done that if not? that he was complicit in it. But you, you mentioned all these facts. Do you believe that they will actually be accountable? We hope that there is justice in the country and that the Hawks, through their raids in the previ Premier's office and the Department of Agriculture and the interrogation of those individuals who already have been charged, will find enough evidence to hold the politicians who crafted this project accountable. The allegations about Freda Farm and the cattle raising project that never was led to an investigation by the Hawks. In this, they froze assets believed to be worth around 10 million rand belonging to the Gupta companies and their bankers, the Bank of Baroda. This led to a court case at the Bloemfontein High Court in the Free State. Both the Gupta companies and the Bank of Baroda dispute the freezing of their money. At the opening of the case this morning, Michael R. Hellens appeared on behalf of the Gupta companies. The National Director has run roughshod over all those rules. And because it was ex parte, your Lordship was not assisted by someone counterbalancing uh, that which was put before you, and which is why we're here for a reconsideration. Now, it's a reconsideration both in the narrow sense and both in the wider sense. And your Lordship was entitled to approach the matter both on the wide and the narrow sense. <coughs> when I talk about the narrow sense, I talk about looking solely at the papers that were before you, or before the court on the first occasion, absent any audi alterum, and looking as if on exception, but now aided by the party affected by the order, should this order have been granted. And we say that this order should not have been granted. Then, Luke Spiller outlined the case for the Bank of Baroda. What the bank does take issue with are the bank's own funds being effectively frozen by, by the preservation order. And that's exactly the effect that paragraph 1.11 of this preservation order has had. In essence, what the bank says is that you cannot possibly describe an amount of 30 million rand which was deposited in 2013 as now being the same 30 million rand in the bank accounts in 2018. The NDP's uh, contentions in that regard are with respect completely inconsistent with the generally accepted principles of ownership of money in bank accounts. They certainly are not borne out by the facts of this case and we say it would lead to an absolute uh, absurdity. Yeah. <coughs> well, the authority itself says the, the money was dispersed again. That's right. So it's that, exactly. So it is common cause that the money was received, but that it then left the account again. So what the NDP in this application have sought to do is not to attach the, in so far as the bank is concerned, they haven't sought to attach the account of a particular <laughs> account holder with the bank. So they haven't sought to freeze a, 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 a depositor's personal right to payment of the credit balance standing to standing to an account. What they've gone and done is sought to freeze a portion of the bank's own funds. And that we say just is, is unacceptable. And the reason for the apparent misunderstanding on the part of the NDPP stems really from a failure to appreciate what is a, a basic uh, principle of practice in, in banking. And it's the distinction between a clearing bank and a non-clearing bank. You'll see in our in the filing affidavit, the deponent goes into some detail as to what that distinction is. But in essence, clearing banks deal directly with each other through control accounts, uh, which are administered and maintained by the South African Reserve Bank. The case is expected to take several days. We're off to a short break, but when we return, we look into Sean Abrams' constitutional court challenge. <laughs>